Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals, sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners. Welcome to the 93rd episode of the Shipping Podcast. Early May, I went to Copenhagen and the Opening Oceans Conference, which is an initiative by Nord Shipping, to gather people who are interested in the unique business potential of the ocean space. I was invited by Opening Oceans organizers to sit down and speak with their keynote speakers, for which I'm very grateful. On this lovely spring day, I met with Matthew Duke and we decided to go outside and sit in the sunshine and listen to the birds singing in the background. I hope that will not disturb you. The acoustics inside was so much worse, so we wanted to have a very good environment to have this conversation. Matthew is the chief business process officer of Greek Star. I have met him before in his previous job and uh, this time I started by asking him how did you get in contact with the maritime industry Matt? That's a good question. I guess like a lot of people you've spoken to I kind of fell into it. I was working in uh, IT in uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, was so lucky that I met and married a beautiful Norwegian woman and then the opportunity came to to work for Oddfjell in Bergen in Norway uh, in IT uh, and that was my uh, my gateway into shipping I guess you could say when was that so that was 2002 quite so, some years ago now <laughs> so your background is are you an engineer or what did you study well i also fell into IT <laughs> so i'm uh, an environmental scientist so i studied sustainable development at university but was always very interested in in computers and programming and building PCs and things like that. So after I finished my degree, I then wasn't quite sure what to do. Unfortunately, in 1995, the world wasn't ready for sustainable development in the same way as it is today. So um, I went into what's called a graduate, graduate recruitment program in a telecoms company. So then they took me in with my environmental science degree and I went through a a program of training in in IT and programming and system support and those sorts of things. So I guess I fell both into IT and then into shipping really. And now you've fallen into this interview <laughs> in yeah, a way. Yeah, there you go. I just keep falling. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So after Oddfjell. Yeah, so Oddfjell was a wonderful experience actually. For me, I guess because I wasn't always it wasn't necessarily the technology itself that attracted me. It was how could we use the technology? So I was very, very fortunate that Oddfjell chose to to train me in shipping, even to the level that we were put through a a training course at BI, a university uh, in um, in Bergen, in international shipping. And some weeks of just understanding what chartering, operations, ship management, what's LACAN, what's demurrage, what's a time charter earning, what's OPEX. It was, it was really, really good, actually. So a very, very interesting company and also a company that that really developed me and gave me chances so i was very fortunate to to get some promotions and i ended up as the global head of it and it's a big company and it was it was very exciting but but the, the red thread really was in the whole career wasn't necessarily the technology but it was my fascination with shipping and how could i apply that technology to help the business do better uh, you know, seeing that a broker was using a laptop to connect to email when they were actually using email to fix cargoes was one of the reasons that Oddfield was one of the first companies out with mobile email. It wasn't because I was fascinated by mobile email. It was because I was fascinated by how much money could we save if the brokers could, could get on their telephone instead of having to start a laptop in a taxi. So that was 15 years of my life. Uh, I had both the experience of being the global operations leader uh, cybersecurity, backup, restore infrastructure, and then the, the, the head of IT, the corporate VP. It was 
I'm very proud of that, that time actually, and, I, and it was also, even though it was of course painful to leave, I, I was very lucky in that I could leave on a very positive note. It was just time to move on, and sometimes it's good to move on on a high note <laughs> instead of waiting for a low note. I think. Yeah, but 15 years is a lot, a lot of time in your life, so it's, uh, it was an important period for me. I think. So then you fell in love with shipping. So absolutely keep falling. <laughs> yeah, that was I think, and it is strange because I mean. I meet a lot of people in conferences and through work and so on, but I still, I still feel there aren't that many of us that are desperately passionate about digital, about technology, but equally passionate about shipping. I found a lot that are either the shipping have passion or the digital passion, but um, yeah, I feel I hope there'll be more of us. We need more of us, I think. I could see us. I could hear us in there. Yeah. So I hope I'm in that in that team. Do you actually team are. digital passionate? About shipping. <laughs> There you go, and we have to do, we have to do it together, don't we? Yeah. And it's sort of one of the things that I really picked up on with some of the keynotes here at Opening Oceans was it's this sort of we have to do this together mm -hmm. because I think those of us that are passionate about the industry are also passionate about the people. Yes. And we want the people to have a future. We don't want this industry to be disrupted from the outside and and. People losing their jobs and not having uh, not having the the courage to to risk trying new things, you know. It's so uh, it's it is quite important. I met someone yesterday who I hadn't met in real life before, and he asked me, "What is your passion? Is it the people or the shipping industry?" How would you answer that question? Well, it's not just related to shipping. So, as I like to say to anyone that cares to listen. Uh, transformation of business processes, transformation of uh, business models, is a highly analog process. It's all about the people. No people, no change. So, uh, without a doubt, for me, life is about the relationships, the people. But that doesn't take away from the fact that I'm extremely passionate about these floating metal boxes going across the ocean and all of the processes around them. But it's it's about the people. Yeah, I answered. I said something like, "There wouldn't be a shipping industry without the people." Mm. But it's also fascinating the the things that the, the shipping is doing for for the global society. Yeah, I mean, it is the I think the, the engine room of global trade. Yeah, very important. Um, but it also has a tremendous responsibility. We can reveal that I've met you before. In Oslo. Yes, because we only uh, got to the Oddfjell part of the story, didn't we? We yes. didn't get to the next part and the part after that. Yes, we did meet in Oslo, and I was uh, employed in Kongsberg Digital, another fantastic company. Yes. <laughs> and I was. What did you do there? So I was very lucky that uh, Herger brought me on to to lead the maritime, the commercial maritime division in Kongsberg Digital. So responsibility for trying to make sure that Kongsberg's digital position from the kind of center of excellence, digital center of excellence in Kongsberg Digital mm -hmm. would, was best suited to support maritime customers. So as part of the launch team of their digital platform, Cognify, and I also uh, signed partners onto the platform and had the great fortune to meet a lot of customers and a lot of extremely talented And interesting people across the Kongsberg organization. So, from people working with ocean farming to Kongsberg Maritime, some other defense people. It's just absolutely fascinating company. Just unfortunately on the wrong side of the mountains for my family, so commuting was less was less exciting. Okay. Hmm. So, what what is your experience from that when meeting clients and so on? How do they how do they find their way into the digital world? The maritime people. Again, I think there are two. There are two aspects for me as an individual in that question. I'd like to answer. One is, for the I think for many many years I've actually been a salesperson in a sense because you have to build trust and you have to in a sense sell the idea of we have to do something different. <laughs> we can't carry on doing what we're doing today. But trust, the experience of trust I had was built on years of delivering results. And getting to know people, it was a highly interesting and important experience to then sit on the other side of the table, 
and meet an executive management team or uh, sometimes the board, whoever, and try to build trust that we in Kongsberg could help them on that digital journey. That was very, very interesting and very rewarding. So my experience was that a good number of customers were, yeah, quite in control, had an idea of what this was, a, a structured innovation process, knew what they wanted. But there was an awful lot of customers that really needed help, truly didn't know exactly how this would affect them. And I felt sometimes the role was almost consultancy to try and give an idea of what the mega trends were in digitalization uh, and very little about the actual products that we had in Kongsberg. But that was how to build trust. And that's how we got some very interesting contracts was to build that trust before then showing the products. So I um, felt there was a kind of a missing, a missing brick in my career was to have responsibility for my own P&L, to have that commercial weight on your shoulders. And it was very valuable. And, you know, again, uh, had Kongsberg been in Bergen, I, you know, I probably would still be there. It was a, there's certainly no bad blood there. It was, a, it was an excellent experience. But ultimately, the family uh, made a decision together that we would, we would not like to move to, to Oslo, to the east. So we, um, we were then very lucky that uh, I fell again, as you would say, into a new role. <laughs> uh, the management team at Gig Star, where I'm responsible for looking at our existing processes and seeing how we can do them better through traditional methods and through digital methods. There's still room to look at improving processes before buying any software. Uh, and also looking at innovation, working very closely with our business development lead uh, to see if we together can find new business models related to my aspect is the digital side then. So, so you changed, changed side of the table now then? Yeah. I did miss shipping, though. That was the thing. I loved working for Kongsberg, but it was sort of, yeah, it was a bit odd not being in a shipping company anymore. Or at least in a, a sort of, yeah, I missed, I missed being on the other side of the table, actually. It was, it was nice to come back. How do you see the future of shipping in general? I think an awful lot's going to happen both. I mean, everyone talks about autonomy. Everyone talks about how ships will not need so much crew and so on but but there is an awful lot of paperwork in shipping that happens on land so i think the idea of not having vessels half loaded because we don't have a, a truly global way of of doing logistics chain properly i think that has to change and will change actually i'm not sure that we can meet the greenhouse gas targets you know and assuming that we don't all have hydrogen vessels in the next few years i think that I think that there has to happen a lot on land <laughs> um, with systemization and uh, open digital ecosystems and a sharing platform economy, very much uh, a lot that we looked at in Kongsberg with the Cognify solution, enabling that part, the, the assets into a sort of an ecosystem. I think that's going to happen. I think it has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, we risk that an actor like a, an Uber or an Amazon or whatever, they will just say, okay, well, here is an open platform and now we've just time charted in a bunch of vessels, so we're going to do it this way and then we will meet the customer's CO2 needs or whatever else it might be. So I think that's going to happen. A lot of changes related to information and so on. And I also think that there will be quite a lot going on in short sea and inland waterways when it comes to autonomous vessels or semi-autonomous vessels. There's a pretty good business case here for, for example, reducing road transport, for opening up ports that otherwise weren't being used. There's a lot of positives to be had there. And the technology's pretty close. Uh, projects like Yara Bikland are only a few years away. So I, don't, I think we'll see a combination then of a lot happening at land, digitalization of much of what happens on board the vessels, and potentially some autonomous changes on short sea inland. What about more collaboration? That is what everyone is talking about right now. Sustainable development goal number 17, I believe, partnerships for the goals, absolutely essential. I think, to be honest, start within. So find out if there are partnerships within, especially companies that are more than just shipping. And to reach these ambitious goals for transformation, at least I have for the industry, we have to have partnerships. We have to work with academia. We have to work with class. 
we have to work with insurance, we have to work with uh, research uh, institutions and startups, and we have to work with each other. We have to grasp that shipping has been based on, in a sense, me not giving you information <laughs> and having an advantage, or me not sharing information because there's a little bit of flexibility in these contracts so that we can make some money. That can't happen anymore. It will change because things like AIS make it possible for me to track where your vessel has been and where it's going. I know what cargoes that particular vessel, vessel can carry, and we know what cargoes go into the ports. There are many, many, many shipping companies that have access to that information. So transparency will happen. So we have to then think slightly differently across the industry and start thinking how can we make sure, as I said earlier, that we don't have empty vessels. And there are many other actors that I feel are, are saying the same thing. Um, this isn't new for me. This is what I've been, sort of been trying to say since about 2012 in Oddfield. It's sort of, we have to, you know, when we started collecting AIS data, it's like, okay, this is going to change chartering in the future. But I also respect that shipping will be probably a lot of shipping actors will be like, well, that would be the last thing we do. But when it happens, maybe we have to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you've got a point there. Mm. And yeah. we have, yeah. But where, where will it start? I mean... Well, containers is, I think, a good example. Boston Exchange, they launched a uh, service to show where there were empty uh, capacity containers. And I don't remember exactly the statistics. You might have to look it up, but it, it was thousands of uh, transactions that have been done through that solution. And then you have Lossa, CEO at Clavenes, and his CDO, Alexander. He has launched, together with the team there, uh, the cargo application. That's kind of in the same direction, isn't it? That's about asking shippers to declare where the vessels are and what the ton uh, their um, cargo is, if they have capacity, and then trying to connect it to the logistics chain of the terminals. So there's two examples of it actually happening already today. Very exciting. Um, Do we see any ports? I mean, I, I hear a lot about the ship owners and the suppliers and so on, but, but I hardly ever speak to the ports. Yeah, so they, they have to be part of this ecosystem. Yeah. So I think in a very simple terms, a perfect logistics supply chain is that you always have just enough of whatever product it is. So then you need to know what the warehouse has or the terminal or the tank at port. So ports have to be part of this. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a lot of integrated shipping companies have terminals and ships. They're already doing this in their own yeah. logistics. So they know exactly what's in the port, but it's been, there hasn't been the need necessarily to, to have an open digital ecosystem because they've done it for their own trades and their own customers. And maybe that's okay for them too. Maybe they don't need to do any more than that. I don't know. As if their vessels are you know, fully utilized in certain niche areas. There is a program uh, uh, led by the Swedish Maritime Administration called STM, which is Sea Traffic Management. I have made interviews with them. And within that project, there is also something called Port CDM, which is uh, Mikael Lind. I met him here yesterday. But you should listen to that. That is how they're trying to get all the stakeholders in a port call to exchange information with each other, which uh, had a bit of a pedagogical <laughs> view first to explain why they should share data of where they were going and so on. They are not sharing the entire route of where they are going, but they are sharing the next stop they are doing and when they are supposed to arrive. Also, in order to, to be the, just in time, mm. in, in the real sense of it, because then you don't have to speed up to be there in case there is a free space for you in port. Yeah, I'm fairly sure that there was a similar project in Singapore called the Sesame Straits project. I think my previous employer, Kongsberg, was involved in that one. Just-in-time arrivals with a, then a slow-speeding leg, yeah. I think will also be a critical win for the environment. Yeah. And maybe sustainability will be the mechanism through legislation, perhaps, that makes these things happen. Because you have to understand that shipping is a really hard business and people don't do stuff just to be kind or interested. They do it to win. Yeah. And any time you think your information is more valuable to you than to your competitor, you're, not, you're just not going to share that information. So we have to somehow, as an industry, 
managed to work out these logistics challenges to make shipping better without ruining the business, if you see what I mean. It's sort of, so, uh, and many, again, you know, shippers have got enough on their plate thinking about, you know, what tonnage are they going to procure now? Uh, where's the industry going? What type of engine, you know, is it a standard two-stroke engine running a heavy fuel oil? Well, maybe not anymore. So, so it's, a, it's a hard time. We have to have a bit of sympathy and empathy for the ship owners and the shipping experts because it's not an easy situation to be in. I agree. I agree. Mm. But how could our industry become more visible? We are not that well known. And we got the passion. We got the bug. You and me got the bug. Mm. But how do we get more people to understand? Because it's in the same, you know, we, we need to get the politicians to understand what we're doing and how we're doing it and, and have them to have some empathy for us. Yeah. Because they are the ones taking the decisions. Yeah. So, I mean, lobbying and having ship owners closely connected to the government. That's not a new thing, at least in Norway. That's something that's been there and will, will be there. Uh, and there's a lot that goes on there. From my perspective, for example, Grieg is it's an absolutely fantastic group of companies with truly visionary leaders. The four owners of the Grieg group, they have a passion to be very successful, to make sure that there is good business, but at the same time, do their best to be sustainable. That is in itself quite unique, uh, I think, uh, and very motivating. So what I'm trying to do at conferences like this one is to promote Grig, <laughs> to try and uh, let people know that there are companies like this and that we need the young generation to help us transform and we're in an attractive working place. So I think shipping potentially could be more proactive, getting together, using money on communication, getting into the magazines, getting onto the social media, getting wherever the next generation is, going to the universities. I know that some big shipping companies do go, but generally to the traditional universities like Southampton. So we probably have some work to do there. One of the things I've seen that's changing now is that we're actually getting more extrovert communications leaders in shipping. My experience, at least for the first 10 years of shipping, if not 15, was that it was a little bit at least in the area that I worked in chemicals and looking at how all the chemicals actors were, it wasn't, wasn't a huge amount of external communication, you know, social media policies to make sure that employees were f forbidden from ever talking about their, you know, working, those sorts of things. Well, that's not going to work, is it? Uh, if, you, if you never talk about how great it is at work on social media, then, uh, you know, that's a bit of a challenge. So, so we have some work to do there. It's not necessarily my area of expertise, but I did have the pleasure of, being part of a, a sales and marketing organization in Kongsberg, and I really got a feeling of how it's done right and, uh, and have a great respect, actually. I learned, it was one of the other things I learned was, wow, marketing communications, that's important. <laughs> Maybe I hadn't fully appreciated that before. And again, you know, just having this philosophy that everything is a, is a kind of a sales process because human beings need to, need to feel comfortable with, with making change. And, uh, and I think marketing communication is a very important part of that. So we have work to do. Yes, we have. Compositing here, yeah. outside. With the birds singing no, in the background. We We've no. got the work to do. Who, do. who do you think I should meet the next time? Who would you be interested in listening to? I suppose Elon Musk is a bit out of the uh, shipping podcast. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> you can always wish. Um, I can wish. <laughs> you know, because he has a couple of autonomous vessels that they can land rockets on from space. So I'm wondering what, what he's going to do with that technology. Is that exclusively for his rocket program, or is he thinking of disrupting the technology providers out there? Uh, he also likes Ian Banks' books, uh, which is the name of the vessel, so I, uh, I'd love to talk to him. Now, I think it would be nice if you could get the perspectives from one of the four in Grieg, one of the four owners of Grieg, Elizabeth Camilla or Claire, or perhaps, or, uh, and if they are not available, I'd quite like to have the perspe perspectives of someone from outside the industry. I think. Mm. Um, that could be quite interesting but i'll think about it and if i have some other names i'll come up that was the one question i forgot that you were going to ask i'm sorry i haven't, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't prepared that no um, problem no problem at all but I, and i did have the pleasure of meeting lasse christopherson yesterday yeah. so we will hear him as well great he's i really enjoyed his presentation and i find myself it's never it's not always necessarily just a good thing but i find myself very much on the same page as lasse so, yeah, I think uh, 
Cloveness is positioning themselves quite well, I think, for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for taking the time again. You're welcome. And hope to see you soon again. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for sharing your insights. And I'm especially happy to hear that uh, marketing and communication is important because that is also my view. If we do not share in social media and other channels how much we love our industry and how interesting it would be to work within the maritime industry, how will people know? I think it goes without saying that it's possible to move mountains if you use communication and online digital communication in the right way. I think we need to do that. I think we are better than the printed media and all the things that we have not yet reached in our industry compared to other industries. We need to join forces and I would be happy to be one of the influencers that move our industry into the same space that all other industries are in. But I need your help. You need to share the shipping podcast. You need to share what you think about this. And you need to come back to me and talk about what you can do to make a change and to make our industry become less hidden and more out there in the open space where we need to be. Thank you for listening to this episode. It's always a pleasure to sit down and talk to Matt. I've got a few more keynote speakers in the pipeline for you. So, from me to you, until the next time, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry.